Good morning, friends, and welcome to the Granite Bay Hilltop Church and our study time together. We've been studying through the book of Daniel. It's called Understanding Daniel. We want to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world. If this is the first time that you are joining us, we've been doing an in-depth verse-by-verse study of the book. Today, we're going to be starting our study in the book of Daniel chapter 9. But before we get to that, we wanted to finish up some stuff that we had studied previously in Daniel chapter 8. We didn't finish with the quiz in our previous study. But before we get to that, let's start with prayer. Dear Father, once again, we are so grateful that we have this time on this day that you have set aside from the busyness of the week where we can just gather together in your presence. So open up your word to study this very important book, one of those prophetic books, Lord, that we as your people need to understand in the last days. So we do pray for your spirit to come and guide us, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now there is a pattern that we see in the book of Daniel, and I've mentioned this before multiple times, but it's so very important that we understand the pattern because it builds one upon another as we study the book of Daniel. Uh, We have the first pattern, you might say, the framework that he set in Daniel chapter 2, and that's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar the king had, and you're all familiar with this, this great image, the head was made of gold representing Babylon, the chest and arms of silver representing Medo-Persia, the belly and the thighs of brass representing Greece, and then the legs of iron representing Rome, and then the feet of iron and clay representing Western Europe after Rome fell. Its territory was carved up. You have the 10 tribes. Eventually, three of them were uprooted, and you ended up with seven, but they formed the nations of Western Europe. And then in Daniel chapter two, the next thing is a stone that comes and strikes the image upon its feet, grinds all the metals to powder, and the wind blows it away, and the stone grows and becomes a great mountain and fills the whole earth. Now we understand in the explanation that Daniel gave to the king, the stone represents Jesus, the second coming of Christ. Now that's the big foundation upon which we build. Now when we get to Daniel chapter 7, we have the same kingdoms that are presented, but they have different imagery. So just quickly, let go to Daniel chapter 7. Let me just highlight a few of the quick things here. And this is where it becomes very important that we understand the pattern that is established. So the framework is given in Daniel 2, but a pattern begins to emerge in Daniel 7. It's important for us to understand this because it explains Daniel 8, and it's very important when we get to chapter 9, and we're talking about some time periods. Now in Daniel chapter 7, you have the four same kingdoms that we read about in Daniel 2, but they're represented under different symbols. Daniel chapter 7, verse 2, that's what it says. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven were striving upon the great sea. The great sea there would be the Mediterranean. That was the great sea in the minds of the people back in Bible times. It says, four great beasts came up out of the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion that had eagle's wings. So what's the first beast that he sees in Daniel chapter 7? A lion with eagle's wings. Who does the lion represent? represents the kingdom of Babylon. We're going to see that as you get into the chapter that actually explains, the angel explains to him. But verse 5 talks about another beast that rose. It says, verse 5, then suddenly another beast like a bear arose. And what was unique about this bear? It had three ribs in its mouth and it was raised up on the one side. Now the bear represents Medo-Persia. The three ribs in the mouth of the bear represent the three principal kingdoms conquered by Medo-Persia on its rise to power. Lydia, Egypt, and Babylon. But then there is another one, if you look over in verse six. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings. Well, what was the kingdom that conquered Persia? It was Greece. And why four wings? Well, wings in the Bible represent speed. And we know from history that Alexander the Great conquered very rapidly, thus four wings. Babylon only had two wings. The lion had two wings. In other words, Babylon also conquered very rapidly. It was ferocious, but not as quickly as Greece. Greece conquered much more territory than that which Babylon had conquered. But then there is a fourth beast that is particularly interesting in verse 7. And I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. Now that gives us a clue as to the identity of this beast. In Daniel chapter 2, What kingdom is represented by the legs of iron? The kingdom of Rome. So this beast here represents Rome. And then it goes on to describe more details. It says it has 10 horns. Well, we know in Daniel chapter two, the image had 10 toes. 
representing the ten divisions of the Roman Empire, when those Germanic tribes came down and conquered up the territory once controlled by Rome. But then it talks about verse 8, I was con considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first were plucked up by their roots. So now we're introduced to another power, a continuation of pagan Rome, but in a different form. We know that to be papal Rome. The three horns that were plucked up represents the three nations that were conquered as the papacy rose to prominence and power there in Europe. The seat of the papacy is, of course, the capital of pagan Rome, Rome, same city, so a continuation. We also find out more about this little horn because it says it's a persecuting power. It's a, it speaks pompous words that you read about over there in verse 8. And then after this little horn power rules for... 1,260 years, then there is another scene that's brought to view, and this is where we need to really pay attention. So sometime after the 1,260 years of papal supremacy, which ended in 1798, when Berthier, Napoleon's general, marched into Rome, proclaimed the rule of the papacy at an end, the pope was taken prisoner, the papal states were confiscated. Sometime after that, after 1798, another picture is brought to view, and this is so important, verse 9. Verse 9, still in Daniel 7, still in Daniel 7, verse 9. I was watching till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. Who's the Ancient of Days? God the Father. Talks about his garment being as white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Verse 10, Daniel 7, 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Notice the next part. The court was seated and the books were opened. There is a judgment scene that's brought to view. So you have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, and then a judgment scene. The judgment scene is not happening on the earth, but the judgment scene is happening in heaven because that's where the Ancient of Days is. That's God the Father. And if you read on in the next few verses, we're not going to look at all of it, but it talks about verse 11. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words that the horn was speaking. So notice that this judgment scene takes place after the little horn has ruled for its 1260 years. So it must be sometime after 1798. And then still talking about this heavenly judgment in verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, behold, one like unto the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? That's Jesus. Coming with the clouds of heaven, that's the angels, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, that's Jesus, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. His kingdom, one which shall not be destroyed. And so at the end of this heavenly judgment... The kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Jesus then comes the second time to claim the kingdoms as his own. So that's, that's the whole panorama, you might say, of history, starting with Babylon all the way to the second coming of Christ. Some important landmarks along the way. So what we understand thus far, we know the kingdoms, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, the papacy, and then we know a judgment is to occur sometime after 1798. We don't know exactly the nature of that judgment, just based on chapter 7. We're going to learn more in chapter 8. And we don't know the time that that judgment begins until we get to Daniel chapter 9. We have a question over there. We'll let the mic people get that set up for us. Keep your hand raised. We'll get it for you. So those are a couple of questions we don't have yet answered in Daniel. We don't know the specifics of the judgment, and we don't know the time when the judgment is supposed to begin. Daniel 8 gives us more clues, all right? Gives us some additional information. Question. Pastor, yeah, I had a question about uh, seven, uh, verse 5. It talks about the bear and the three ribs. Yes. And it, and it says, the, the Bible says, and they encouraged him to arise and, and defeat. And they said, arise and devour, and devour much, flesh. much flesh. Now, that's the ribs that are saying this? Who's the they? No, the they is the one overseeing the vision. So it could be the angel that's explaining the details. Remember, uh, this is seen in vision, so Daniel is seeing these things happening and he's hearing things taking place. That voice would be a divine injunction. In other words, it is giving permission to this power to conquer these nations. Remember, according to Daniel 2, God is the one that raises kings up and he puts them down. So even though 
you know, kingdoms might think, well, I've raised up by my own strength. It's really God that gives them the permission. So that voice would be something coming from heaven saying, conquer, devour much flesh. So that's, that's the picture there. Okay, then in, uh, verse 8, where do we get the 1260-year rule from? The 1260 days actually come a little late in chapter 7 when it says he shall rule for a time, times, and a half a time. And that's the explanation that's given by the angel. Now we know a time is a year. There are 360 days in a Hebrew year. So three and a half years with 360 days each would be exactly 1260 days. And one prophetic day is equal to one literal year. You're asking about that verse. It is in uh, Daniel chapter 7. If you look down, persecute the saints of the Most High. This is verse 25. And the end of verse 25, for a time, times, and a half a time. So we know a time is a year. That's three and a half years. That's 1260 days. Now, that's not the only place that we find this time period. We also find it elsewhere in Scripture, especially in Revelation chapter 12. So we, so we know what that time period is. All right, well, let me keep going then. So we laid the foundation, and we talked about this judgment that takes place sometime after 1798, but we still don't know the nature of this judgment per se. So that brings us to chapter 8. Something interesting happens when you go from chapter 7 to chapter 8. Does anyone know? How many of you remember? I mentioned this at the very beginning of our study of chapter 8. It has something to do with the actual writing of the book. There is a change that takes place between chapter 7 and 8. Does anyone know? You got it. It goes from Aramaic to Hebrew. Now that's interesting. Daniel chapter 7, he's talking about these pagan countries, these pagan nations, these kingdoms. But when we get to chapter 7, yes, we're still talking about Medo-Persia, and we're talking about Greece, and we're talking about Rome. But the focus of Daniel chapter 8 is the little horn power and what it will do to dilute the gospel and how it tries to counterfeit the ministry of Christ. It's sanctuary language that we find in Daniel chapter 8, so it switches back to Hebrew. Also, all of the other animals spoken of thus far, Daniel chapter 7, they're all unclean beasts. But you get to chapter 8, you have a ram and you have a goat. They're both clean animals that were used in sacrifices. It also talks about horns in chapter 8. And of course, horns were featured in the sanctuary itself. There were horns on the altar of burnt sacrifice, horns on the altar of incense. All right, so in chapter 8 then, the imagery that Daniel now sees is a ram. And I'm just going to tell it to you. It's right there in chapter 8. You can read it for yourself. But it is a ram that has two horns. And the one is higher than the other. And the angel explains to Daniel what that is. And you can actually find that in verse 20. Daniel chapter 8 verse 20. You don't have to guess as to who the ram represents. The angel says, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. Okay, no debate there. The Bible tells us what it means. But after the ram, there is a goat, and the goat has a notable horn between his eyes. The angel explains that in verse 21. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. And it says, the large horn between its eyes is its first king. But then that horn was broken and four other horns grew up in its place. Verse 22, it says, For the broken horn, as for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of this nation, but not with its power. So when Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided up amongst his four generals and they eventually separated the kingdom into four separate powers. The next power that's brought to view then is a horn power, a little horn. Now, the reason we have an all horn representing... Uh, the papacy here, Rome, first in its pagan phase, but mainly in its papal phase in, in chapter 8, is because in Daniel chapter 7, we spoke about a little horn that grew up and uprooted three horns. So basically in chapter 8, it's telling us to go back to chapter 7 and look at what those horns represent. They represent kingdoms and powers. Where were those horns to arise? Well, they're in Europe, right? So in chapter 8, when it's talking about another little horn arising, and this horn will speak blasphemous words, he'll persecute the saints, he'll rule for 1260 years, we know what that horn is. It represents the papal power. And then according to Daniel chapter 7, after the horn has ruled for this period of time, 1260 years, then in Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, actually verse 13, Oh, this is the best part, all right? Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. So the horn is ruled, 1260 years. We know that came to an end in 1798. Then something happens after that. Daniel chapter 8, verse 13. Then I heard one holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking. So two angels, you might say, are speaking. Holy ones, right? This is in vision. 
How long will be the vision, he asked, concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? Now this is sometime after this little horn power has trampled the sanctuary underfoot. It's diluted the high priestly ministry of Jesus. It is substituted a false gospel for the real gospel. And the question is asked, how long is this power going to be allowed to pollute the sanctuary? Now, when we're talking about sanctuary, remember that there's no earthly sanctuary in, se in the sense of a building. The building was destroyed in 70 AD, but the Bible says, no, you're not, that you are the temple of God, if the Holy Spirit is within you, right? The church is the temple of God. There is a heavenly sanctuary where Jesus ministers in heaven for us. So the question is asked, how long are the truths pertained in the sanctuary and the services and the work of Jesus, how long is that going to be trodden underfoot? The answer comes in verse 14. And he said unto me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. In other words, the truths of the high priestly ministry of Jesus and the special work that he is doing will continue, according to this, for 2,300 years. Now, we don't know when the time period starts. That's actually given in chapter 9. But from Daniel's time period, it's a very long period of time that's going to stretch all the way to the time of the end. But at the end of that time... Then the sanctuary will be cleansed, meaning the truths of God's word will be revealed. There will be a great revival taking place amongst God's people in the church. And that will culminate in this final judgment and the second coming of Christ. Yes. Yeah, actually, uh, Pastor, in uh, Daniel 8, it's very clear when this 2300-day time period starts. We see early on, we see the little horn destroying the temple or at least desecrating the sanctuary. And the 2300 days is actually an answer to the question of how long until the sanctuary is cleansed. So the 2300 years or days starts with the desecration of the okay, sanctuary. Well, let the let me address sanctuary. that quickly. Let's, let's assume that's the case, right? So the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC. Well, actually, it was closer to 604, 603 BC, somewhere in there. So if you take 2300 literal days, that's about six and a half years. For, so from 604 BC, you go forward in time, six and a half years. Was the temple rebuilt six years after the Babylonian captivity? No. So you, you say, well, it can't be literal then. It must be symbolic. All right, well, if it's symbolic and you start in that date and you go forward 2,300 years until the sanctuary is rebuilt, when was the sanctuary rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity? How long was that? 70 years, right? It actually talks about it in Daniel chapter 8. So we, we, need to, we need to apply the prophetic principle when studying these different time periods. But you know, Mike, we'll get to that a little later on. Hold, hold that question until we get to that. Daniel chapter 8, we'll deal with it more. Or Daniel 9, I need to keep moving through you, otherwise we'll never get through. All right, now, with that as our background, here's our quiz. All right, how much do you remember from our last study? In which languages does Daniel switch to writing starting in chapter 8 and continuing to the end of the book? Is it A, Greek? Aramaic or Hebrew? I gave you the answer, right? The answer is Hebrew. That's right. Question two. According to the Bible, what does the ram with the two horns symbolize in Daniel chapter 8? Do we have to guess as to the answer or does the Bible tell us? It is the kingdom of Medo-Persia. All right. Question number three. In Daniel's vision, why is the goat described as not touching the ground? Is it A, to symbolize the Greeks' connection with the sky gods, to emphasize the speed at which Greece conquered, or to represent the agility and the grace of its first king, Alexander the Great? A, B, or C? The answer is B, to represent the speed with which Greece conquered. Number four, after the death of Alexander the Great, what happened to his empire? There was a peaceful transition of power to a single heir. Now, it is interesting to note, uh, Alexander the Great did have an heir. He did have a son, but he was just very young. I think he was a year or two old. He wasn't very old. And as soon as this power struggle began, uh, his son was put to death, along with his wife, Roxana, was also put to death. So there was no heir. They made sure that there was no heir to sit on Alexander's throne, and his generals divided it up. All right, well, point number B, a power struggle amongst the generals or the empire remained unified under a single ruler. Do you know the answer? Let's B. Number five, what power is symbolized by the little horn that we read about there in Daniel 8? Is it Medo-Persia, Antiochus Epiphanes, or Pagan and Papal Rome? A, B, or C, the answer is C, and we spent a whole time talking about that earlier. Number six, what was Satan's strategy after direct persecution of Christians failed? 
the incorporation of pagan teachings into the church, directly attacking church leaders and clergy, or creating a clear separation between the church and the state? Is it A, B, or C? The answer is A. Remember you have the legalization of Christianity in 313 by Constantine, and now suddenly Christianity became the in thing, and if you wanted to hold a position in the government, it helped to be Christian, even if you weren't truly converted. And so a number of pagan teachings crept into the church. All right, point number seven. What is the taking away of the daily sacrifice symbolized? Are we talking about a literal taking away of the sacrifice in Jerusalem? Well, no, it's much more than that. The distortion, concealment of Christ's true saving sacrifice on the cross, the decline of faith in God's promises, or the end of daily prayer. Is it A, B, or C? The true sacrifice, of course, is the cross. It's what Jesus has done for us. Any earthly sacrifice was but a shadow of the true sacrifice. Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. When Jesus left the temple for the last time, he said some very profound words. He said to the religious leaders, he said, your house is left to you void or desolate. In other words, Jesus disowned the temple in Jerusalem at that point. And when Jesus died on the cross and the veil was rent from top to bottom, God in essence said there is no longer any value to the sacrificial system on earth in Jerusalem. Now our focus is not on an earthly Jerusalem, an earthly temple, but it's the new Jerusalem and the heavenly temple. Now there is a shift, and we begin to see that as we read on in our study. Verse 8, what does the papacy cast down? Does it cast down the truth of the law of God? Does it uh, cast down um, conducting religious rituals or the authority of the bishops and the priests? Is it A, B, or C? Well, the answer, of course, is A, there are two commandments in particular that run against Catholic theology. The first commandment is the second commandment in the Ten Commandments, which says don't bow down to graven images. That's a problem. So in the official Catholic rendition of the Ten Commandments, there is no second commandment. It's gone. And they take the Tenth Commandment, they divide it into two, so you could still end up with Ten Commandments. They've also tampered with the Fourth Commandment. You know what the Fourth Commandment is? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? The church claims to be the one to change the solemnity from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. So it has cast down the truth of God's law as well as the high priestly ministry of Jesus. Point number nine. What is the defilement of the heavenly sanctuary that we read about here in Daniel 8? Is it the presence of fallen angels, the record of sins in the heavenly books of judgment, or the offering of sacrifices? Now you'll recall when we studied this, we spent quite a bit of time looking at all of the verses in the Bible that talks about the books of record in heaven. And there's two books in particular, actually there's three very important books. There is the book of remembrance, which is the good deeds that have been done. There is the book of sins, or the book of iniquity, and then the Lamb's book of life. Now in the judgment, if your name is in the Lamb's book of life and you've confessed your sins, your sins are blotted out of the book of iniquity or the book of sin, right? It's gone, it's washed away. But in the judgment, if you have proven unfaithful to Jesus or you've turned your back on him, your name gets blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. So everyone's gonna have something blotted out of the books of heaven. The books are gonna be cleansed. Either the books are gonna be cleansed from sin in our case, that's what we want. Or those who are turning away from Christ, their names are cleansed from the book of life. Once that work of judgment is finished, then Jesus comes. Point number 10, or question number 10. What does the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary signify? Unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. It marks the beginning of a period of rest and celebration. It represents a time of judgment prior to the second coming of Christ, or it indicates the beginning of a thousand years of peace. Is it A, B, or C? The answer is B. It represents the time of judgment prior to the second coming of Christ. Now, where would we find God's last warning message found in the Bible that goes to all the world just before Jesus comes? Where would you go to find that? You go to Revelation chapter 14, right? And you go to the first angel's message that says, Fear God, give glory to him. What's the rest of the verse? For the hour of his judgment has come. So Revelation chapter 14, the first angel's message, is a reaffirmation of what we read in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now in Revelation 14, it says that cleansing has begun. The hour of his judgment has come. Of course, Daniel chapter 9 is going to tell us exactly when that is, and that's pretty exciting. We'll get to it. Number 11, are the 2,300 days in Daniel 8 to be interpreted literally or symbolically? Now, we spoke about this. We know it represents 
a symbolic time period of 2,300 years. Point number 12. Why did Daniel find the prophecy of the 2,300 days perplexing? Now, let me just finish up here. If you look in Daniel chapter 8, you don't want to miss this part. It's important. After it talks about the 2,300 days, the angel says, the vision, this is verse 26, Daniel 8, 26, and the vision of the evenings and the mornings which is told is true, therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. So clearly the 2,300 days reaches all the way into the future. But now, verse 27, and Daniel fainted and was sick for days. Afterwards I arose and I went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. So here Daniel can't understand something about the vision that he had just seen in chapter 8. Well, let's ask Daniel. Daniel, did the angel explain to you what the ram with the two horns represented? The answer is yes. Daniel would say yes, it's Medo-Persia. Did the angel explain to you who the goat is? Greece, yes. And who that first horn is? Yes, it's first king. Did the angel tell you what would happen when that horn was broken? Four others would grow up in its place. Yes, the angel explained that. Did the angel explain that another power would arise that would persecute God's people and would trample the truth and would misrepresent the truth for a very long period of time? Yes. What did he not understand? The 2,300 days. Why didn't he understand that? Because Daniel, of course, is a captive in Babylon. His heart is for Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple. He had been reading and studying, as we're going to find out, in the prophet Jeremiah, that the captivity was to be 70 years. But now in vision, he hears about a much longer period of time, 2,300 years. He can't reconcile the two. Thus, it says he is sick and he faints. Nobody understood it. And that state of confusion continues for 13 years before the answer comes back. Why does it go on for 13 years? Because there was something God wanted Daniel to notice before the explanation comes that we find in Daniel chapter 9. Oh, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll get there. Number 13, did Gabriel, the angel, return at a later time with further information? The answer, of course, is yes. Gabriel returns and instructs Daniel about the 2300 year or day prophecy that we read about, Daniel 8, 14. And finally, question number 14, to what time period does the 2300 days extend? To the end of the temple services in Jerusalem? No. The beginning of the Crusades in the Middle Ages? No. The time of the end and the start of the investigative judgment? Is it A, B, or C? The answer there is C. Okay, well that was just... Our background to our study, okay? So here we go, Daniel chapter 9. Very important that we understand the context because we're going to get into some of the details as we get into our study. All right, so let's start in verse 1. If you have your notes, you can follow along. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. Again, if you have a question, you can raise your hand and we'll take it. We'll take the slow because there's a lot of information. In the first year of Darius or Darius, there's different ways of pronouncing his name whether it's Darius or Darius. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ashuarus, that would be his father, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Who are the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans is another name for the Babylonians. The Chaldeans were actually a tribe that was the leading tribe, the ruling tribe in Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar was of the Chaldeans. All right, after the fall of Babylon, Darius, the Mede, ascended to the throne. However, his reign was short-lived as he died two years later and Cyrus the Persian became king. The events chronicled in Daniel chapter 9 occurred during the first year after Babylon's defeat in 538 BC. The time between the vision of Daniel chapter 8, the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 8 verse 1, and the vision of Daniel 9, the first year of Darius, or Darius, Daniel 9 verse 1, was about 13 years why 13 years? Well, what happened during that time period? During this time period, Babylon had fallen, Darius was made king, and Daniel was given a leadership role in the Medo-Persian government. All things that had to happen in order for the 70-year prophecy to reach its fulfillment. Let me remind you of what happened. Daniel chapter 6 talks about the lion's den, Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel chapter 6 verse 1 says it pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought of setting him over the whole realm. 
So during this 13 years, Daniel goes from just a captive in Babylon to being now very much involved in court life there in Persia, right? He's seen two kings. Well, you've got Darius, and then, of course, Cyrus comes a little later. Daniel is a witness of all of this. He was involved in the Babylonian government with Nebuchadnezzar, but uh, Belshazzar didn't have much use for, Bab- for, for Daniel in Babylon, so he was kind of pushed to the side, as you read about in Daniel chapter 5, when it talks about the fall of Babylon. But now, again, Daniel is reinstated. He has a very important position in the Medo-Persian government. Okay, moving on, verse 2. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So what's he doing during these 13 years? Well, he's pretty much involved in this big transition from Babylon to Medo-Persia, but Daniel is still studying the word. He's still reading and studying, and it's during this time period that he reads again the writings of Jeremiah. Now, who was Jeremiah the prophet? Well, Jeremiah the prophet was a contemporary of the fall of Babylon, meaning that he prophesied in Jerusalem before Babylon fell. And he was in Babylon when it fell. And Jeremiah the prophet wrote to the Jews in Jerusalem at the time before the fall and said, you need to submit to Babylon. But of course, they stubbornly refused to receive his counsel. Jeremiah was eventually placed in prison, in a pit, in a dungeon for a period of time. But it's believed that Jeremiah, knowing that judgment was coming upon Jerusalem, he was pretty much involved in the hiding of the Ark of the Covenant, somewhere around Jerusalem where it is probably still today, I think. It's there hidden in one of the caves somewhere in the area of Jerusalem. So Jeremiah had written, now this is almost 70 years later, Daniel is in now in Babylon, but it's actually the Persians that's in charge of things, and he's reading the scroll, he's reading the writings of Jeremiah the prophet. And as he's reading Jeremiah, he realizes, wait a minute, this is even creating more confusion because it says 70 years for the Babylonian captivity, but how does that fit in with the 2300 years that I remember hearing that I wrote down after that vision recording Daniel chapter 8? So there's confusion in the mind of Daniel. And what does he do when he's confused? Well, he studies more and he prays. He goes to the Lord in prayer, asking for an explanation, an understanding, and that's where we find Daniel. Okay, well, let me read the note there. It says, despite being heavily occupied with court duties and business responsibilities, Daniel found time for prayer and study. He possessed a copy of Jeremiah's writings and carefully studied them to obtain light on the duration of the Jewish captivity in Babylon. Here is an instance of where one prophet searches the writings of other prophets for additional light. If it was necessary for a prophet to search the scriptures, it is more essential that we do the same today. Amen? So if we want to reach a clear understanding of Bible truth, we need to search the scriptures. Look at what all the prophets say on a particular subject. Here we have a verse in 2 Peter chapter 1, and here we have the principle that I think, was Peter a prophet? This is the apostle Peter. Was Peter a prophet? Yes. He had the Spirit of God. He was powerfully filled with the Holy Spirit. He performed miracles. God communicated with him. Peter, along with the other apostles, they were prophets as well. But notice what he says. This is 2 Peter chapter 1, the little book that he wrote. He says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. You can pause right there. What prophetic word is he talking about? Well, if you read a little earlier in 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter is describing an experience that Peter, James, and John, and Jesus were involved with. On one occasion, Jesus said to the disciples, he called Peter, James, and John, he told the rest to stay, and he said, come with me, and they went up onto a high mountain, and Jesus was glorified before the disciples. Remember that story? His clothes began to shine as the sun, and then two people appeared next to Jesus, Moses and Elijah, and they talked with Jesus. Well, Peter, James, and John, they were there, they were witnesses, they saw that. And at the beginning of chapter 1, Peter is recounting, recounting this experience. He says, we were there, we saw it, we were eyewitnesses, talking about how that the glory was manifest in Christ. He says, we haven't followed cunningly devised fables. This is the wording that Peter uses. But we were there, we saw it. But then, in addition to an eyewitness account, he goes on here in verse 19, and he says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed. And when he talks about the prophetic word, he's talking about a prophecy in the Old Testament that helps to confirm that Jesus is the Messiah. Then he goes on, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Then he tells us this, and this is what we don't want to miss. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is for any 
private interpretation. What is a private interpretation? A private interpretation is where I open up the Bible and I find a prophetic passage and I read a verse and I say, well, I think that means this. Or I might read a verse and then open up the newspaper and try and find something in the news that ties in with this verse and say, well, this is what this verse means based upon something else. Or I read some commentary uh, that somebody has written and I say, well, all right, that's what the, mo the word means because some other person said it. That would be considered a private interpretation. What then is not a private interpretation? If a prophet in scripture explains another prophet, that's not a private interpretation. You, are you with me? So when we're reading the Bible that a beast rose up from the sea, should we just guess as to what beast that is? Or do we need to allow Gabriel to explain and say, that beast represents Medo-Persia, and that goat represents Greece, and its first horn represents its first king? You've got to allow the Bible to explain itself, right? And that's what Peter's telling us, especially when it comes to prophecy. No prophecy of Scripture is for private interpretation. In other words, there needs to be a backing from Scripture to the law, to the testimony. If they speak not according to this, there is no light in them, the Bible says. So all theology must be backed up with Scripture, right? Otherwise, we end up with a false idea. Then he goes on to say, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is for private interpretation. Why? For the prophecy never came by the will of man. It wasn't one man's opinion or one man's thought. But he goes on. But holy men of God spoke as they were what? Moved by the Holy Spirit. Now the phrase there, moved by the Holy Spirit, it's more than just you being moved by the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's true. God does move us. God does speak to us. But this moving of the Holy Spirit is inspiration. It's prophetic inspiration. And there are certain signs that we have to distinguish between a true prophet and a false prophet or a counterfeit prophet. And one is, if, God, if that person is a true prophet, God will communicate with them through dreams and visions. Now, we all have dreams, but visions is a different story. There are also some signs connected with the vision. And Daniel speaks about no breath left in him. When John in Revelation saw the glory of Jesus, he fell to the ground as one who is dead. There was no breath left in him. So it's a supernatural thing where the prophet doesn't breathe normally during that vision. It's something visible. They can see it. They can remember it. They can record it. Angels will come and visit them, talk to them personally. So for somebody to claim the gift of inspiration, to claim to be a prophet, you need to immediately ask some very important questions. The other important question is, does their revelations agree with the word of God? right? Where did Daniel go to get a clear understanding of his vision? He went to Jeremiah, right? Where did Peter go to get a clear understanding of his experiences? Well, he went to the Old Testament. What, what passage did Jesus quote to help validate his mission when he was preaching in the church there in Nazareth? Jesus quoted from Isaiah the prophet. So you even find Jesus referring to the prophets to validate his message. And so the prophets, the scriptures, they, they connect one to another. So anyone that comes and says, well, I have a revelation, I have a vision, and it contradicts what the prophets are saying, then you know that's a counterfeit vision or dream, right? That's not the real thing. So we need to let the Bible interpret itself. All right, moving on here. In the vision of chapter 8, Daniel was confronted with a puzzling statement at the end of the chapter. After 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. This left him deeply perplexed as he grappled with the relationship between the 70 years of captivity predicted by Jeremiah and the much longer 2,300 prophetic days mentioned in the vision. How did the two time periods relate to each other and what impact would they have on the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem? These are the questions that were in the mind of Daniel. How does it all fit together? Now, it's interesting if he doesn't understand something, which Daniel did not understand, he didn't jump to conclusions, but he went back and studied. And he went back to the Lord in prayer and said, help me understand. I think that's a good pattern for us to follow. If there is something we don't understand in Scripture, don't throw it out. Don't ignore it. But go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, help me understand. And then do your part in searching the Scriptures. Search. Where else do the Bible prophets talk about this particular subject? And we'll come to a clearer understanding of God's will through his word. Now, here's the passage that Daniel must have read in Jeremiah that got him thinking. Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12. It says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. It's talking about Jerusalem and Judah. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass, when the 70 years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon 
and that nation. So here Daniel is reading. He knows he's been in captivity. The Jews have been in captivity almost 70 years. He knows that 70-year time period is coming to an end. Jerusalem is still in ruins. The temple is still, you know, hasn't been built. And the Jews who are to rebuild the temple are still captives in Babylon. So how is this prophecy going to be fulfilled? So Daniel starts to pray. All right, verse 3. It says, Then I set my face towards the Lord God to make my request by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And as you read through his prayer, you understand that the burden of his prayer is first repentance. He's confessing his sins and the sins of his people Israel. But then he's also claiming the promises of God. And he's saying, Lord, you have promised in your word. And when he says you have promised, I think he's thinking about the promise made through Jeremiah the prophet. That after 70 years, the Jews would go back and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Because you see, that's the burden of his prayer. Restore the temple, he's asking. So that's the burden. Now, while the Lord had promised to deliver his people at the appointed time, Daniel was keenly aware of the conditional nature of God's promises found in the Bible. Now, we're going to come to that in just a minute. Jeremiah chapter 18. God's promises are conditional. There are a few in the Bible that aren't conditional, but almost all of the other promises in the Bible are conditional. Can you think of one promise in particular that is not a conditional promise that God made to the people of the earth? There, you got it. I was waiting. I knew someone would get it. That's right. Remember after the flood, when Noah and his family came out of the ark, and there was the rainbow, and they offered a sacrifice, and God made a promise that he would never flood the whole world again. That promise was not conditional upon how good or how bad the people were on the earth. However, the Bible does tell us that there is another judgment coming at the very, very end, not with water, but with fire. But that was a promise that God made, that I'll never again flood the whole earth. And of course, that promise is true. All right, but there are conditions on promises. For example, let me read you Jeremiah chapter 18. This is a very interesting promise. Listen to this. The instant I speak, and Jeremiah is is speaking here uh, as God speaking, the instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And in the instance that I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build it and to plant it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good which I had said I would benefit it. So you see the conditional nature? Notice the context here. Jeremiah is talking about nations. Do you believe that God blessed this nation and raised it up to do a special work? Of course, if you read in Revelation chapter 13, you have a lamb-like beast that arises from the earth. We know that is the United States. And God has blessed this nation. And anyone who has been outside of this nation and has come back to the United States, you can see how God has blessed this nation in a wonderful way. We have the freedom to stand and preach and teach right here where we are right now. There are many places in the world today where we couldn't gather together like this and open up the word of God. So God has blessed this nation in a wonderful way. But there are conditions to the blessings upon this nation. Revelation chapter 13 says that the time will come when the lamb-like beast begins to speak like a dragon. There is a change. And after national apostasy, the next thing is national disaster. So God has kept his hand over this nation. He's protected it. But the time will come where the very principles of religious freedom will be set aside. And God's blessing can no longer continue. And as a result, judgment eventually comes. And finally culminates in the outpouring of the seven last plagues. Not only for this nation, but for the whole world. Just before the second coming of Christ. So there are conditions. Is those conditions true for an individual? Yes. For a church? Yes. For a people? Yes. So we want to be faithful in continuing in all the light that God has given us. Not turning away, not saying, well, you know, I am a chosen person. We are part of a chosen church. Everything's fine. We're going to do our own thing. We're part of a chosen nation. Of course, that was the problem with the religious leaders in the time of Jesus, right? They thought that they were a chosen people. And Jesus said, the kingdom will be taken away from you and given to another, bearing its fruit. So there are conditions to the prophecies. And of course, Daniel understood this. Let me read on. Middle of the note here. It says, he may have been concerned 
that the impenitence of his people could delay the fulfillment of the promise. Additionally, the vision of Daniel 8 had foreseen further desolations for the sanctuary, leaving him in a state of profound perplexity. So what exactly does this all mean? So he is praying. Let me read on. The next note, it says, in addition to his readings about the 70-year captivity in Jeremiah, Daniel must have also come across this passage in Jeremiah chapter 29, which says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, says the Lord. I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. Aha! So Daniel's reading Jeremiah and he hears about this promise that if we turn to the Lord and if we pray, he will fulfill his promise. He will return his people back to where he had driven them from. So he has hope. So Daniel comes before the Lord with hope in his prayer. Consequently, Dan, Daniel sought the Lord through prayer, supplications, fasting, and humbling himself with sackcloth and ashes. He placed his trust in God's faithfulness to his promise and fervently believed that God would respond to his prayer. Verse 4. And I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made confession, and I said... O Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. Notice the way he begins his prayer. He says, O my Lord, great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and mercy. He's emphasizing God's mercy and God's willingness to fulfill his promise. At the end of the 70-year captivity, as a junior, Daniel became increasingly focused upon the prophecies of Jeremiah. He recognized that the moment is approaching when God would grant his chosen people a fresh opportunity to start anew. And with fasting, humility, and fervent prayer, he implored the God of heaven on behalf of his people Israel. Now, I don't know if there were others, but I'm sure there were others in Israel at the, or Jews in Babylon at the time who also earnestly sought the Lord. I'm sure they also read Jeremiah. So Daniel was not alone in this, but you can, you can sense his passion, uh, his earnest desire, and earnestly confessing and asking God for deliverance of his people. Verse 4. Oh, we did that one, didn't we? Still reading on. Daniel's heartfelt prayer. This is the note under that, under verse 4. Daniel's heartfelt prayer begins by recognizing God's faithfulness and willingness to fulfill his promise and keep his covenants. He stresses that any failure in the covenant is because of human failings and not because of God's unfaithfulness. He also highlights the inseparable connection between loving God and keeping his commandments, which Jesus also stated in John 14, 15, when he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. The true church at the very close of time will be made up of those who keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. So when we come to the Lord in prayer and we are confessing our sins, we also need to be asking and saying, Lord, where am I falling short? Where am I not keeping your commandments? That's part of repentance. It's saying, Lord, what can I do? Give me strength. Help me to keep your commandments, right? John chapter 14, verse 21, Jesus said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by a father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So you have repentance, but you also have willing obedience that is brought to view. All right, verse 5. We'll finish up with this verse. He says, we have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Notice the words there. We have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedly. Now, there are three words that we find in the Bible that have reference to sin, that we think of as sin. The one word is sin, which literally means to miss the mark. So God has a standard. To fall short of that standard, that's sin, transgression of God's law. There is another word that we find, and that's iniquity. And iniquity is an interesting word. You might say sin is the external breaking of God's law, but iniquity is the internal breaking of God's law. It has to do with the heart. It has to do with selfishness. And so here he's saying, Lord, forgive us for breaking your law, but forgive us for our selfishness, which leads to wickedness, right? So when we pray, we are not just praying, Lord, please forgive me for what I did. We should be praying like Daniel, saying, Lord, cleanse me from the inside, like Daniel, like uh, David prayed. Cleanse me, make me whole, give me a new heart, put a new spirit within me. And that was the burden of his prayer. And why do we want this new heart? Why do we want this new spirit? Well, he goes on, so that we 
or be able to keep your precepts and your judgments, we can give glory to you. We can live a life that brings honor and glory to your name. That's the burden of his prayer. Let me close by reading this note. Daniel doesn't boast about his own, his own righteousness. Instead of claiming to be pure and holy, this humble prophet aligns himself with Israel's most sinful. The wisdom God has graciously bestowed upon him far surpasses the knowledge of the world's great men, like the sun's brilliance compared to a faint star, when speaking of Daniel. Yet he pleads for his people with profound humility, tears, and heartfelt contrition. He lays bare his soul before God, openly confessing his own unworthiness while acknowledging the Lord's greatness and majesty. We're told in James chapter 4, it's one of my favorite verses, James chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I just lost it. Is that where, oh, James chapter 4, verse 10. And where did, oh, there it is. It's a short verse. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and what will he do? He will lift you up. That's what Daniel was doing, humbling himself in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord was about to lift him up, as you're going to see in our next study. An incredible answer to Daniel's prayer. Let's close. Dear Father, once again, we are grateful for your word. We are thankful for prophecy. Indeed, it's the light that shines to a bright and clearer day and gives us a fuller understanding of where we are in the stream of time and what is yet to come. But Father, also in your word, in prophecy, we see the, the spirit that needs to be present in your people, in your church, a humble spirit, seeking for your glory, asking for sincere repentance and a change of heart. Father, we want to be amongst those at the end who are faithful, that stand faithful to, to you and can look up when you come and say, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Keep us faithful. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Thank you again for joining us today. We're going to take a short break and then we'll continue with our worship service. <laughs>